let's start with the kind of uh, official introduction of um, <coughs> Professor Martin Trattel from the University of Mainz in Germany, who will be talking today about a frequency-based approach to measure or constrain the absolute neutrino mass scale with an experiment which is known as Project 8. Martin studied physics at the Technical University of Munich in Germany, where he <coughs> finished his master degree in 2009. Afterwards, he did his PhD at ETH in Zurich in the NPSI, um, Paul Scherrer Institute, in the group of Klaus Kirch, where he was working on the NEDM experiment. Um, he graduated in 2014. Then from 2014 to 2016, he was working as a postdoc at the University of Washington, where he got involved in two fundamental particle physics experiments, the muon G minus two experiment and the project eight experiment, which will also be subject of his talk today. And already in Washington, he was promoted to become an assistant professor for physics and got then in 2019 a call from the University of Mainz, where he's since then working as a full professor operating a group which focuses on high precision determination of the properties of neutrons, muons, and neutrinos to provide superb tests of the standard model of particle physics and the standard model of cosmology. So, Martin, we are very happy to have you in the seminar today, and we are looking forward to your presentation. And with that, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Stefan, very much for, for this very nice uh, introduction and the kind invitation to, to uh, the seminar series, which is really fantastic, uh, carrying us through like this very special times here where we can't have like seminars in person. So as you mentioned already, I'm gonna talk about an experiment uh, called Project 8, where we try to uh, assess the absolute uh, neutrino mass scale with a new frequency-based technology. But before I uh, dive into, into Project 8 itself, let me just give a short shout out basically for the standard model and what its troubles are. And uh, so what we know by now today is that the energy content of the universe that we see uh, is made of mostly made up from what we call dark energy on the order of like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let's start with dark matter of about like 27%, but we don't know really what the dark matter structure and particle uh, content is. You've heard a couple of talks already addressing aspects of dark matter, like Dima Butka talked about, about this aspect uh, a couple of months ago. We have uh, the dark energy roughly making up 70% of the, of the energy content of the universe. There we have a candidate in terms of the cosmological constant to explain what's going on. In this picture that I show of the Andromeda galaxy, gravity like it dominates all these cosmological structures here, but like it's completely absent in the, in the standard model of particle physics. The only really idea of this 5% that we have about atoms is what we call the standard model of particle physics that contains quarks and leptons and force carriers with the last boson basically being the Higgs boson uh, discovered. And there is questions around like the one most obvious in this picture is like the baryon asymmetry. Where is all the antimatter that should have been created in what we call the Big Bang? Uh, and another interesting question where we dive in today is basically we know that neutrinos have masses, but we don't yet really understand how large they are and how actually the neutrinos get masses at all. So it's very fair to say that the standard model as we know is, is definitely not, not complete. So let me arrange a little bit the, the neutrinos in what we call the frontiers of particle physics, which we often like divide up in like the high energy frontier of particle physics, where we produce new particles by ever pumping more energy in collision uh, events and cosmology. And on the other hand side, like high precision uh, experiments and the exposure frontier where we observe more and more particles to study their, their properties ever more precise. that feedback. Let's try again if the feedback is okay. Now the feedback stopped. Thank you. And so in cosmology, we can look at the large scale structure formation, which is, for example, impacted by the neutrinos. Uh, in uh, analogy to the cosmic microwave background, we could expect a cosmic neutrino background, 
and the standard model of cosmology, so we call them the CDM. In astroparticle uh, physics, neutrinos play a role as messengers from supernovae, for example, intergalactic neutrinos. And on the high energy, uh, on the high precision and exposure frontier, neutrinos play a prominent role in the process of charged lepton flavor violation, for example, in the search for neutrino less double beta decay. And obviously, in the study of highest precision allowed processes, for example, of beta decay spectra that we use to access uh, to, yeah, to access mass or uh, new forces. And the prominent neutrino flavor oscillation experiments are obviously in that category. And so it's fair that neutrinos basically have a share in all of these fields and are bridging between these fields and also the question for, for their masses. So what have we learned so far about neutrinos? We've learned that neutrinos are basically a superposition. The flavor states are a superposition of three mass eigenstates. The flavor states are what participates in the weak interactions, the decays of, of particles, for example, and then we have the free streaming propagating neutrinos in, in vacuum. We can conveniently separate out basically these this relationships, these linear superpositions in a matrix form called the PMNS matrix. And uh, there is a real elements, there are faces, there's one uh, CP face in there, a Dirac face, and we have the uh, possibility that there's also like two Majorana faces that would only be uh, non-zero if the neutrinos were their own antiparticles. But the experiments that I'm gonna talk about cannot tell any difference uh, between Majorana and Dirac uh, nature of the neutrinos, only the observation of neutrinos that will be that decay could tell. But what we can learn from the flavor oscillation experiment, what we have learned is for uh, is the, the size of the matrix elements, the PMNS matrix, and the mass square differences between the mass eigenstates. And you can see that on the, on the left side, for one of the splitting between uh, mass state two and mass state one, we know its absolute size, we know that it's fairly small, and we know its sign. For the splitting between the, sec uh, the third and the second mass state, we only know its magnitude, but we don't know the sign. And so we are left with these two uh, possibilities of arranging the, the mass states on the, on the vertical axis, which we call the normal ordering, if we would assume that the small splitting, the so-called solar neutrino uh, mass splitting is at the bottom of the, of the scale and the large uh, splitting on the top. Or we call it the inverted mass ordering if it's just upside down and the small splitting is on, on top. But a question that cannot be answered also from flavor oscillation experiments is where is actually the absolute zero on this vertical uh, mass scale? We don't have any sensitivity to, to this scale here. And so the question is how do, what handles do we have to assess the absolute ma uh, mass scale of the neutrino? And there is basically three complementary routes that we can learn about uh, this question in, in different observations of nature. So we have different tools, we have different observables, and I'll just give you an overview here of what's currently the best limit in this area and where we think we could potentially reach, and then also comment a little bit on the model dependence. So I pointed out before that like from cosmological observations, we can derive limits on the sum of the neutrino masses, and the current best limits tell us that the sum of these masses uh, is most probably not larger than 150 milli electron volts. And that depends on the multi-parameter cosmologic model and how you interpret the data and subtract foregrounds, backgrounds, and so on. So th there is model dependence in, in these numbers, but potentially we have a reach down to roughly 20 to 50 milli electron volts for this cell. I already hinted at the neutrino double beta decay experiment. There we have a handle on, on an observable, which is called a, a coherent superposition of these masses an effective neutrino ma uh, Majorana mass in this process. And here we have the current best limits on the order of like 200 milli electron volts to 400 milli electron volts, and can then go down to roughly 20 to 50 milli electron volts. But the model dependence here is actually the, the structure, the nature of neutrinos. Are they Majorana? Are they Dirac? Can this process happen at all? And there is significant uh, uncertainty in in this mass introduced by these very difficult nuclear mass, uh, nuclear matrix element calculations that need to be performed to interpret a measured half-life in the neutrino less double beta decay in terms of a mass of this effective mass parameter. And then the third approach that we can take 
is a purely kinematic approach where we only need to assume momentum and energy conservation and measure and perform a spectroscopy of decay electrons or electron capture processes. And there we are sensitive to, to this mass combination, which is an incoherent sum over the, the masses of the neutrino uh, states. And the current best limit is the recent limit from Katrin, which is 1.1 eV. And we think we have a potential reach down to like the 40 milli electron volt range. And project eight, we think is one of the uh, opportunities to, to have a new technology to approach that, that goal. And so we have three different combinations of masses and we have three fairly diff very different uh, approaches to these observables. So let me just point out the complementarities between these approaches. And so I show you on the, on the slide, the relation between the sum of the neutrino masses as we uh, observe them or derive them from cosmology and the M beta parameter, the parameter that's probed in uh, beta decay or electron capture decay experiments. And I also indicate the prediction for the inverted ordering and the normal ordering of the neutrino masses um, in blue and, and, and red. So what we currently know or up to a couple of uh, last year, basically, the best limits were uh, provided by the Mainz and Troitz experiment for M beta on the order of two eV. And then this was uh, recently improved by, by Katrin to 1.1 eV. After Katrin is done running with its full statistics, their sensitivity limit should be on the order of like 200 milli electron volts. And you can see that like there is already a restriction cutting in into this band of, of uh, blue and red uh, phase space for the neutrino masses. We use project eight, we think that our new technology we can devise an experiment with a goal of sensitivity of 40 milli electron volts. And now you see that we would basically cover the whole uh, phase space that's allowed under the inverted ordering if we can achieve that sensitivity goal. And the new technology is also important because we cannot just scale up Katrin uh, ever more. There's an intrinsic physical limit in using the TT molecule, uh, T2 molecule for the decay spectroscopy at around 100 milli electron volts. And so we have to beat that, that limit too. And then from the right hand side, as I pointed out, cosmology cuts into this phase space. And if you look at the relation now, what's like the lowest uh, limit on the left hand side from the cosmology, cosmology this favored region, you might see that like it's unlikely that Katrin will be sensitive enough to see any, any effect if we can uh, put all the trust in the models we have. And so how do we actually really assess uh, the neutrino mass scale in beta decay? The first people to point out that you can actually have a handle from decay electron spectroscopy on the neutrino mass is Fermi and Perrin. So it's both within like a couple of weeks that they basically proposed the idea that you could look at the precision spectra of, of uh, beta decay to extract uh, neutrino mass information. And this is this famous plot uh, that Fermi published where you can see that like, the shape of the spectrum at the end uh, will change depending on the, on the mass of the neutrino. If it's zero, it's more quadratic or small and, and large. And the idealized situation that we can look at is like the decay of tritium, which is a super loud beta decay. And ideally, we want to have that happening in an isolated atom. And in the simplest case, we would just assume a single neutrino mass state. And if that were true, then we would have basically a description of the differential uh, spectrum, which is just a combination of constants of nature, it's Fermi constant mass of the electron, the nuclear mass uh, matrix element for tritium, and then a purely kinematic uh, term that covers all the, the kinematic uh, dependence, just momentum, energy, and the mass of, of the electron and the neutrino. But we have learned, oh, sorry, yeah, any, any new spectrum, any new decay channel also modifies that spectrum potentially. But we've learned that like the neutrinos are actually a superposition. And so we have to take that into account by uh, adding other constants, namely the element of the PMNS matrix here and uh, have a sum, then we still have the energy independent matrix element. Uh, and again, the purely kinematic parameters and the heavy side function here just in, uh, enforces energy conservation in the decay to the different 
to the different mass states. And so if you assume that you have an effective uh, or a, a mass parameter and beta of 200 milli electron volts, then you can see on the right hand side that first of all, the spectrum endpoint is actually shifted below the Q value compared to no uh, uh, zero neutrino mass. And also the phase space uh, changes characteristically that it basically turns over and falls steeply towards zero instead of like fading out uh, with a quadratic function at the end. And so here I define that mass parameter uh, M beta as the, as the square root of the incoherent sum of the squares of the individual masses. And so you can ask yourself which isotope is now really a good one to, to use for these investigations. And there it's interesting to consider how many actually events happen in the last EVs or uh, in, a, in a region below the endpoint delta E and the branching fraction uh, scales like the delta E over the total decay energy to, uh, to the cube. And so there's candidates, obviously I've talked already about tritium, there's rhenium 187. And a couple of years ago, there was also measurement of, of the Q value of indium 115, which initially looks very nice because it has an extremely small Q value. So you would assume that a lot of decay, a, a large branching ratio to the endpoint region is obtainable, but the problem is this is a very small branching fraction on top of a very strong other uh, decay that's roughly at 500 kV. So for rhenium, this was investigated, but it was experimentally disfavored in the experiments of Manu, Maibida, and Mare. And so for indium, there has not been an experimental scheme so far. And so tritium remains, and that's also the isotope that's the current workhorse in the, in the field if we talk about single beta decay spectro, uh, spectroscopy. And so what's the challenge you have to face? The challenge you have is to obtain a high sensitivity. You need a very high luminosity of the source. You need an extremely high energy resolution to not smear out that small uh, spectral change in the endpoint region. You have to control uh, the inelastic scattering rate in a gaseous source. You don't want to have electrons uh, colliding in an uncontrolled way and losing energy. And because you have a high luminosity source, you need a safe way of handling the, the tritium involved in the, in the uh, experiment. And so this was uh, initially implemented and suggested already in the, in the 90s to build this magnetic adiabatic collimation with electrostatic filter setup for short MEC-E. And you can see it on the left-hand side, uh, the principle, the source decays in a high uh, magnetic field region, and then the electrons are guided in a low magnetic field region and what happens is because the, the, uh, the magnetic moment related to the cyclotron motion of the particle is actually an invariant, the momentum gets aligned in the forward direction and you can analyze this with an electrostatic filter. And so then you only count electrons that basically uh, outrun your electrostatic retarding potential. So you make an integral measurement. This was already used in Mainz, Troitsk, and also in Katrin. So let's look at the Katrin experiment, which is the abbreviation for Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment. And overall, it's like, it's an amazing, impressive setup. It's like 70 meters long. And uh, we st they start out with like uh, injection of, of the tritium in a, in a source that has roughly 10 to the 11 becquerel of tritium activity and keeps the molecular tritium at roughly 20, uh, 30 Kelvin. In this, in this source with a pressure of 10 to the minus three millibar. It's a windowless source that you, because you cannot allow the electrons to intersect any material. So this is a fish eye view of the whole setup of the, of the source. Then they have a differential pumping section where they already like reduce the pressure of tritium because in the end you don't want to have your tritium in the spectrometer. They adiabatically guide the electrons uh, through chicanes where they then basically can uh, cryopump on argon frost residual tritium that remains in the beam line. And with the pre-spectrometer, they suppress the electron flux by, by about seven orders of magnitude. So they set a, a first threshold that most of, uh, rejects most of the decay uh, spectrum of tritium before it enters the main uh, spectrometer. And uh, the main spectrometer is the picture that you've most probably seen in the press which is a 10 meter diameter ultra vacuum vessel with a pressure on the order of 10 to the minus 11 millibar. 
And by that point, they've suppressed the tritium concentration by 14 orders of magnitude. And that's a, a, just a, a look on the inside of the spectrometer. And then the electrons, once they pass the main spectrometer, they get counted in a low background segmented detector on the far end of the experiment. And so after many, many, many years of uh, building and studying uh, the experiment, uh, they had first light in October 2016, and for the first time operated tritium with low concentration in, in 2018, and then last year announced their first result uh, in 2019 in September. And so let's look at this result, and it's a beautiful result. They have taken data in April 19 and scanned the endpoint region with 27 different high voltage set points for a total of more than 500 hours. Uh, not all of the pixels were working off the detector, but it's still on the left-hand side, you see this extremely nice uh, spectrum. And I have to point out that the error bars are blown up by a factor of 50, that you're even able to see the, the error bars on, on this plot. It's amazing. And so they fit their spectrum with a full fit parameter in the endpoint region with uh, the neutrino mass squared as a parameter, the amplitude signal, the decay endpoint, and a background rate that would basically just offset the, the count rate on the vertical axis. And so the best fit parameter they obtain is a negative value of minus 1 plus 0.9 uh, and minus 1.1 EV squared. And then it used two different statistical methods to derive a 90% confidence level. Uh, and they give the, the result of the lokonov tarkov uh, method to be 1.1 EV. But with this amazing result, what is actually the, the limiting systematics? And could you just scale up the Mackey filter? And I've taken a, a plot from Katrin Valerius that she showed a couple of years ago, basically showing the contributions of the different effects to the systematics and statistics to reach the 200 milli electron volt uh, limit. Now you can see here, aspects related to the source are, are already extremely well under control. In the left plot, basically the red dashed lines indicate the, uh, the requirements that were set for, for this particular uh, parameter, like the temperature or the buffer pressure, and the source just outperforms uh, the, the requirements, which is absolutely amazing. But you also see that there's a large contribution from this final state spectrum. And this is the irreducible excitation uh, contribution that I've talked about before, that like the decay of a molecule always can excite rotational and vibrational initial and final states that cannot be controlled from the outside, uh, but are an intrinsic property of, of the gas source itself. And then you have elastic scattering in the T2 gas, meaning that you have like energy losses as you transport the electrons through the beam line. And for example, electrons can scatter into the acceptance cone of the McGee filter. And so the big challenge is if you want to have a new technology that goes beyond the, the reach of Katrin or potentially can go beyond the reach of Katrin, is that you want to develop an orthogonal set of systematic effects. You want to ideally have a very different class of backgrounds and you have to achieve the high statistics. And so there are several approaches uh, that, the, uh, that the community develops, which are basically crossing field boundaries because that just within the single fields, we're not gonna reach uh, our goals. So we can either think about new isotopes or we can think about keep on working with tritium. Ideas about new isotopes is, obvious, is, the, uh, is the use of holmium-63, uh, 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 which is an electron capture decay, and then you perform spectroscopy uh, with microcalorimeters, and the ECHO and Holmes collaborations are uh, pursuing that way with support measurements from the NUMAX collaboration. For tritium, uh, Katrin also has ideas about using possibly a, a time of flight uh, filter. There is a, a nice assessment of, of that possibility. Or we think as project eight, there might be a completely new technique to electron spectroscopy and we have uh, call it a cyclotron radiation emission spectroscopy. And so let me introduce this idea to you. Uh, it was an idea that's proposed by uh, Joe Formaggi and Ben Monreal in 2009. And if you put your radioactive source into a magnetic field, the decay electrons will actually start to move a spiral on cyclotron orbits 
and start to emit radiation because it's an accelerated motion. And so the source is also typically transparent to the microwave radiation. And that means that if you can basically detect the radiation, the microwaves outside of your source volume, you don't need to transport the electron from the source to the detector. You can just measure it in situ. And in addition, it's all based on a high, it can be based on a highly precise frequency measurement. And we are all familiar with this uh, simple formula that relates the uh, cyclotron frequency to the magnetic field and the kinetic energy of the electron. And this is just a picture showing you the, the dependence of the cyclotron frequency on the electron kinetic energy with the classical uh, non-relativistic limit for one Tesla magnetic field in blue, and then the nearly linear dependence of uh, the cyclotron frequency for on the electron kinetic energy. If you ask yourself how much power is actually emitted, then it's a feeble amount. It was calculated like more than 100 years ago, but typically like for an electron in the order of like 18 kilo electron volts, spiraling perpendicular to the main magnetic field in a one Tesla field, it's only a femtowatt. But I mean, this is technically, uh, there is uh, detectors available that readily can do that. And so we have taken basically, or taking a four phases approach to develop uh, this new, new idea. In a first phase that we finished in 2016, we wanted to show really a proof of principle that you can actually detect these feeble signals from, from mono energy conversion electrons from a Krypton source in a waveguide setup. In a second phase, we wanted to apply this new technology then to a real tritium experiment uh, where we look at a continuous decay spectrum of electrons and not just monoenergetic electrons. In a third phase, we do an R&D project and operations that we can actually develop all the critical technologies that we need to, to demonstrate to scale up an experiment. This means we have to basically show that we can also pick up the, the radiation signal, not just in a waveguide, but with an antenna array that surrounds a, a source volume. And I already pointed that in the end, we want to have atomic tritium uh, as our source gas. And so we have to learn about how we produce the atomic tritium, how we characterize it, transport, and then also confine it. And then in phase four, that would be really an atomic tritium decay measurement uh, with a mass sensitivity on the range of 40 milli electron volts. But that will only start beyond uh, 24. And so we take this phased approach and we have outlined here, I just outlined the results that we've published for these different uh, stages. The first phase is, is really finished. The phase two has just finished uh, taking the tritium data and is close to the, to the final analysis. And then for the other phases, we basically have studies and build test stands and assess conceptual designs. So let me introduce CREST a little bit more in detail because it's so different, we have to first of all look at the uh, relation between the energy resolution and the frequency resolution. And you can just derive that from the basic formula I've shown you before. And you can see that the relative energy, kinetic energy resolution is actually gets a penalty factor in the, of about a factor of 28 compared to the frequency resolution in the energy range of interest for us, around 18.6 kV. And so this means that if we want to have a kinetic energy resolution of roughly 200 milli electron volts, we need to measure the frequency on the order of 410 to minus seven, which is not a very complicated measurement. Uh, so for uh, 27 gigahertz cyclotron frequency, this means you have to resolve a frequency of roughly 11 kilohertz. And that means you have to actually observe your electron for long enough time as it spirals in the, in the trap we need a trap, otherwise we couldn't observe it for that long. And we also want to have a trap that actually does no work on the particle itself so that the kinetic energy is remaining constant. And that we achieve with a magnetic trap. And so the very first implementation of our magnetic trap, you can see here in this picture where we have uh, a waveguide setup and just two coils, we call them bathtub coils uh, at the position of the, of the arrows create a magnetic field uh, on top of the background field, which is pointing upwards on the order of one Tesla. And so what you can see in this animation is just the MACE filter 
inverted, we built our magnetic bottle and electrons with a pitch angle large enough uh, are reflected from that high magnetic field region on the right hand side. And the uh, edge angle is basically given by this famous relation that the sine of the, the angle is just proportional to the square root of the, of the ratio of the, of the magnetic fields. Where do our electrons come from? We basically fill in our krypton calibration gas through these two pipes here. And then the gas is confined in this waveguide section just with capped on windows that are indium sealed. We use uh, an external rubidium 83 source that emits the krypton 83, which then is highly converted uh, to emit the monoenergetic conversion electrons that we then going to detect. The signal that the electrons emit in the waveguide are guided to a cryogenic amplifier chain. There's a direct path straight up. And then there is also radiation that's emitted basically down the setup and then reflected at the bottom, what we call the waveguide short, and also reflected up to the setup. The whole setup was still very tabletop. You can see on the left-hand side the whole, whole setup of phase one. We basically have this insert that I've just shown you sitting in this NMR magnet, which is charged such that you have a one Tesla magnetic field. You see Ben LaRoque, one of our then grad students, working on the experiment. And in this uh, section that he's pointing to or working on, that's where basically our low noise amplifiers sit. And that's uh, what's shown on the right-hand side. We have a superheterodyne receiver chain that basically converts the frequency range or the signal from the frequency range of 25.2 gigahertz to one gigahertz. And that happens, there's a cryogenic section and then in the room temperature, we basically mix down the signal and digitize it. And uh, let me show you basically our first event that we've ever seen here. Uh, after we digitize the signal, we Fourier transform it in short time slices and then we can plot the power versus frequency as a function of time. And what you, the typical signal structure is that you have a sudden onset of power once the electron is born, uh, you see this excess. Then you see a linearly rising frequency as the electron loses actually energy due to the uh, cyclotron radiation that it's emitting. So you get this, uh, the frequency increases. And then what we see is energy changing gas collisions. Each and every time we have a step in this signal, this is when the electron collides uh, with a background molecule. And that's what typically would happen statistically from the transport of, a, of an electron to the, from the source uh, to the detector. And so we can see these steps. And within uh, the very for the very first result that we have, basically we were able to measure this, this krypton spectrum and you can see the, the different doublets and the single line of, at 18 kV. And we were able at that time to resolve uh, the 50 EV split uh, L doublet in 2015. It took us a little bit to optimize our trap and then we were able to record that splitting uh, or the, the split line uh, with a full width half maximum of roughly 3.3 EV. And because the, the technology is so different, let me show you some live data that we've taken from what we call a real-time spectrum analyzer that basically is able in real time to show you the evolution of such a signal uh, of the electron. And let me start that video. I hope it will work for you well. And you can see basically on a central frequency of 1.4 gigahertz, a window that's 85 megahertz wide, time is to the uh, vertical. And then the higher frequency is basically going to the right hand side, which means lower energy. And so these streaks that you can see in, in power, these are actually electrons that we can observe live in the setup. Each and every time one is born, we get that excess of power. And so the Crest technology is quite unique compared to other detectors in terms of, for example, pileup. I mean, how does pileup look like here? We, if we had two electrons with different energies, they would start at different frequencies. They could not possibly end up in the same uh, frequency bin to mimic a pileup. These electrons could have or will have distinct start times when the signal starts. They will have distinct scattering patterns in, in your records. And also the detected power level would be different uh, because the power emission depends on the frequency. So these are all very unique cut planes that we have uh, 
for quest signals that are not available in a standard solid state detector, for example. And we also can perform a fully differential measurement compared, for example, to the MAC-E filter uh, technology, because we can just record a certain frequency band uh, of interest and do that while we record other, other energy ranges. So we have a very different set of cut parameters compared to classical electron spectroscopy. We've heard also a lot about uh, traps in this, in this series of, of seminars. And most often we have seen that, we, that the people use penning traps to, to obtain uh, pris, uh, pristine control and highest uh, energy resolution. And there you have the, the nice feature that you have these separated eigenmotions for cyclotron axial and magneton motion. In the magnetic trap that we are using, we actually don't have that. So we have a non, an electron confinement with a non-trivial electron motion. You can see that in the simulation here on the right-hand side. The electrons don't follow a nice path than uh, you see on the left-hand side, but a really uh, complicated uh, trajectory. And so we had to develop a signal model that predicts the frequency sidebands that we see due to the magnetic field modulation and the Doppler effect that, observe, uh, that comes from the fact that we observe basically the electrons along the axis of the waveguide. And so let me present you one of these signals, how they typically look like. We see a central carrier frequency in this, in this spectrogram. And then we can zoom in on the sidebands. If we zoom out, we see sidebands roughly 80 megahertz uh, apart. And these sidebands themselves still have some substructure that broadens the, the band itself. And this is just a reflection of, of the more complicated uh, motion in the trap. And this background is basically to non-uniformity in the background we had in the first phase of our experiment. And so in the second phase where we wanted to go now to measure uh, molecular tritium, we first of all needed a source for the decay electron for the tritium, which allowed us to safely handle the tritium gas, could deliver the gas in the range of like 80 to 300 Kelvin and allowed for a fine uh, regulation of the, of the pressure because the pressure in the background gas basically sets the average duration of the track. When does the electron scatter with a background uh, molecule determines for how long you can actually observe the track. But an additional agreement uh, ingredient to this to a successful measurement is also that we know the magnetic field in the formula. We need the B field to convert frequency to kinetic energy. And so we combine that with the source of Krypton 83, where we have well-known conversion electron energies distributed over 9 to 32 kilo electron volt. And that allows us to observe or to measure the B field long-term stability with the big advantage that the Krypton goes exactly where the tritium also goes. And so it's really a co-magnetometer that we apply here. We had to rebuild basically our insert a little bit to make it tritium compatible. And so we've chosen to use now a circular waveguide instead of a rectangular waveguide because intrinsically the cyclotron radiation is circularly polarized. And so to maximize the coupling, we use a circular waveguide and then transform the signal with a lambda quarter plate into a linear signal that then is transported uh, with rectangular waveguides. We confined the tritium gas with calcium fluoride windows. We couldn't just use Kapton, it would just diffuse through and be spread all over in the, in the lab. We also improved the number of, of trapping coils we have, so we have more flexibility. In the first setup, we only had three traps. Now we have five traps to actually tailor the shape of the trap. We have the uh, possibility to inject known frequency signals through a so-called tickler port into the setup. We again deliver the gas here in the gas line. We have a guide cone that centers the whole uh, set up in the magnet. And then we have a bus bar that cools down uh, that cell to temperatures on the order of like 17, uh, 70, between 70 and roughly 110 Kelvin, we can choose a working, working range. And so this is the setup that we commissioned with Krypton and then finally used with tritium gas. The whole operation system is not as, not really tabletop anymore. Our gas system grew a lot. It didn't fit on the table to the right-hand side of, this, of the setup anymore. But otherwise, it's basically still very much the same than phase one. We have the NMR magnet for the background field. We have the cryostat that contains the, the amplifiers. 
and uh, all the diagnostics. And so let me point you to the calibration measurements that we perform. The trap depths actually determines the energy resolution and the line shape. And so we have to characterize that with monoenergetic krypton conversion electrons before we can go and measure with tritium. And I will talk about shallow and deep traps for the rest of the talk. And I want to point out what that actually means. So on the right hand side, you'll see a plot of the background field in the magnet. Um, distance position is on the on the x-axis and on the on the vertical axis is just an arbitrary offset magnetic field uh, subtracted. And in the case if we use two of the of our of our trapping coils, you can see that we introduce these dips and we introduce them such that basically the bottom of the trap is all at the same frequency, which means that the trap depth, the, the ratio of the minimum to the maximum is actually varying for the different traps, but we have to do that just to have the same emission frequency of the electrons uh, for electrons born at the center of the trap. And so the, the trapping efficiency is, is different, but the, the uh, emitted frequency spectrum should be the same. So these shallow traps have the advantage that they provide us with very high energy resolution, but for the cost of, of pitch angle acceptance. And so I show you here a measurement of the 17.8 keV line in a shallow trap that we have recorded. Um, we have to develop a detailed sh uh, line shape model. And that means that basically we have to understand the krypton decay physics, meaning the contribution of shake up and shake off electrons uh, when the conversion happens. And there is just a, a very new paper from Hamish Robertson and Vedanta and Kapath uh, about that theory uh, to really understand the line shape that we see here. And we have to take into account that the electrons, yes, they can still scatter in a gas column, collide with different background gases like helium, uh, krypton itself, or hydrogen that's, that's in, the, in the setup. And so what we uh, were able to do is to measure this line with a line width of 2.8 eV. And from the known uh, natural line width, we can such derive an instrumental width of 2 eV. With the Krypton AE3, we were also able to show the extreme linearity of Cress. So on the right hand side, you can see the, the uh, measured line positions of the K line and the L, M, and N doublets all the way over roughly 40. 14 uh, kilo electron volts. And the fit residuals are uh, pointing out here that like the residuals are smaller than 50 milli electron volts across the whole range. So we have a relative uncertainty here uh, from the fit are remaining on the order of 310 to minus six for, for the kinetic energy of the electrons. What we were also able to extract from this measurement is the energy of the 32 uh, keV gamma line and this very, is in excellent agreement with the literature value. You can see that within uh, the error bar, we extract what we would have expected uh, from just going to, to the literature. And just to zoom in here on one, one example, this is this M doublet, which is roughly split by, by 7 EV, and we can nicely resolve that with a full width half maximum on the order of like 3 EV. So let's go on and look uh, for tritium. To really operate an experiment with tritium, we have to safe, uh, safely handle the tritium and we stored ours in uh, a metallic getter in a, in, uh, from size, which basically provides us a release of tritium but continuously pumps impurities like carbon monoxide and so on. And so in uh, fall of 18, we opened the bottle with the radioactive tritium into our gas system we saw the first tritium reaching the gas system. It wasn't completely uh, uh, clean, so there was some helium-3 already in it, and we had to, to devise a way how we get rid of all the helium-3. But within a couple of days, we basically were able to do that. And now you can see that once we heat up the, the getter, uh, we mainly release T2 gas, so at, at mass 6, and only a small fraction of, of other isotopologues like HT or H2. And after we've basically cleaned up our tritium system here, we've opened the valve to the cell, releasing tritium inside the cell. We then started to stabilize our, our background pressure for the tritium. 
And within three hours, our analyzers were able to dig out the very first signal that we've uh, recorded from, from tritium gas. So we can now really talk about spectroscopy of tritium gas uh, that we've performed that, that step. So in 2018, we took a first set of data and uh, to understand exactly the, the, uh, the event acceptance as a function of energy and thus frequency. And we've done that by subdividing our frequency region of interest over three digitizer bands to be able to cover more uh, energy band. Then we've included in our simulations and the studies all the, the frequency dependent properties of this radio frequency mixing stages and uh, performed a detailed study of the frequency dependent of the event acceptance rate, otherwise the read screw basically our spectrum. And so the result of the 2018 data you can see on the right hand side here, uh, this is an analysis provided by our grad student Christine Klassens, uh, where you can see uh, the fitted model and the endpoint and the extracted endpoint from that, from that uh, measurement agree very well within the error bars. But to get our full uh, data set, we implemented a couple of improvements uh, during 2019, which for example, uh, concerns the background uh, gas density stabilization. I mentioned before that scattering uh, lengths of, of the events depends on, on, uh, on the density, but also our detection efficiency for single events, for very short events depends on this lengths. So we have to be able to stabilize uh, the average lengths of our signals to make sure that we don't start to miss very short, short tracks. And we also had to find a mitigation way to uh, deal with the helium-3 that's actually produced by the excess tritium that's not in the gas phase, but that's absorbed on the gas system walls and continuously produces a lot of uh, uh, helium-3 from the decay. Uh, and we had to get rid of, rid of that. But during winter 2019 and 2020, then we were able to have uh, the instrument live for uh, roughly 80 days. And in this configuration, we actually measured with so-called deep traps. And on the right-hand side, you can see that now, that basically now the depth of these four traps is not on the order of, let's say like 50 microtesla, but on the order up to 800 microtesla. And that's a trade-off basically between higher statistics because of larger pitch angle acceptance and lower energy resolution uh, that we can, uh, can obtain. And in this case, we had done a limited effective volume of roughly a cubic uh, millimeter. And you can see here the spectrum, the counts that we've been able to record with again, the three digitizer bands that overlapped. And once you remove all the duplicates, you left with three, uh, roughly 3,800 counts. For the full Trium data set, we also performed again systematic studies using Krypton E3. Now again with these very deep traps and we see how broad now the, the line shape is. And we had to develop uh, a line shape model and we figured out that it's very sensitive that, model, uh, that shape on the gas composition, helium, krypton, hydrogen in the background gas. Also, Christine performed a very nice uh, detection efficiency study that again takes into account all the signal propagation in the waveguide system and the noise contribution that happen at different stages of signal proce uh, processing. And one way we've done this study is basically by adding uh, the so-called field shifting solenoid that you can see on the right hand side inside the NMR magnet around our setup and then shift the magnetic field uh, such that the signal frequency of the monoenergetic conversion electron walks over the digitizer input range. And so we can study at each frequency the relative acceptance rate. And so I can show you the preliminary data uh, in the endpoint region here, which is an analysis result of, of Talia Weiss at MIT, who performed the Bayesian statistics analysis on, on our data, taking into account uh, uh, final state distributions, for example, in the molecular spectrum. And so what's very remarkable is we did not detect any, any event above the endpoint of tritium. So we can actually set a background rate, which is extremely low of roughly 3, 10 to the minus 10 uh, events per uh, EV 
per second is a 90% credibility interval. And uh, we can extract an endpoint which is fully consistent with the literature value, but obviously from this very small volume, uh, not, not a competitive uh, value, but like we can already extract an endpoint with an uncertainty of roughly 25 electron uh, volts. So these are the preliminary results from, from phase two, where we have really for the first time uh, applied CREST to continuous beta decay spectrum uh, of molecular tritium. And so where, we, where do we think we go from, from here? For phase three, we basically now have to demonstrate all the critical components that allow us to scale up the experiment to a larger volume. And that means that first of all, we have to show that we can leave the waveguide setup and uh, really pick up the signal with a phased antenna array that is surrounding basically a decay cell. Then we have to have a larger magnetic field environment. We cannot just make our, our gas denser because then the scattering rate would go up. So we need to uh, actually grow in volume. And that means we have to grow in magnetic field volume and we're gonna do this in this MRI uh, magnet that was commissioned at the University of Washington. And then in addition, we have to show that we uh, can produce and handle the atomic uh, tritium. But we first of all start obviously with atomic hydrogen and we take a multi-prong approach to this cold atom production. So let me quickly mention a couple of, of aspects of, of this development. So the magnet, uh, this MRI magnet was installed at the University of Washington. It's providing us with a nominally one Tesla field, could go up to a higher, higher field if we need it, but it provides us now like a 90 centimeter bore diameter compared to like 50 millimeters in the MR, NMR magnet. And that's due because we removed all the plastic covers that typically uh, hide this core part of an MRI facility from the patient. This allows us to have like a 45 centimeter sphere of roughly a part per million field homogeneity. And we will use this as a dedicated test bed for magnetometry, for amplifier testing, for material testings. And then you can see like a sketch idea uh, on the right hand side at the bottom. We will basically insert then our setup into this, into this magnet on the rail system. We study in very much detail, basically different approaches to build this phased antenna array to be able to pick up the crest signals. In each and every uh, single antenna, we never will reach more, a signal to noise more than one. So we won't be able to, to trigger directly on a single channel. And so we have to uh, apply cross correlation techniques like in astronomy to construct a signal or to construct a combination of individual signals that we can then trigger on. So there's various antenna concepts under study for electrical properties, mechanical properties, and so on. And we have also published a paper about like the simulation package that we use called Locus that has been used initially for the waveguide setup and is now also developed for the antenna arrays. In terms of the atomic hydrogen production, we perform a multi-institutional approach at the University of Washington, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and locally here in Mainz, where we explore different uh, aspects of hydrogen cracking, velocity distribution diagnostics, beam accommodation, so cooling, uh, how we guide the beam. We need to spin polarize the beam then to magnetically confine it in a gradient trap. And these are all aspects we're gonna, gonna investigate over the next couple of years. And then we have like a phase four conceptual idea where we bring all these, these uh, uh, technologies together where we would start out on the left-hand side with molecular tritium from a recirculation loop, for example, crack it, start to cool it down in an accommodator and, and cold nozzles, and then spin polarize it to confine it in a magnetic gradient uh, trap that you can see on the right-hand side. And this trap would then be surrounded by an antenna array um, to observe the decay electrons emitted by atomic tritium in the end. And so this would allow us to, to get rid of uh, all the molecular excitation uh, degrees of freedom if we just work with purely atomic. So you see this has to scale up on a fiducial volume on the order of, of 10 cubic meters. And this is uh, the work that we, we anticipate to happen in the future. And so let me come to my summary. In the first phase of project eight, 
we have shown that like it's possible to directly observe the cyclotron radiation from a single electron, low energy electron, and we've successfully established uh, CRESS as a spectroscopy technology. In the phase two that we are about to finish now, we basically have developed a tritium compatible cell. We've performed the first tritium measurement, have taken the data, and the final analysis is well advanced. So we hope uh, to wrap this phase up uh, to commit basically all our time then to phase three, where we have a strong R&D program to demonstrate that we can actually really scale up all the critical technology components uh, for a, a viable concept for a phase four uh, experiment that then is able to probe really down to the 40 milli electron uh, range of MBA. And so let me end with acknowledgements to the whole collaboration that have contributed to this beautiful experiment. And as so many of us basically also here, we had our last collaboration meeting completely online in Zoom. So thank you very much.